Okay, Tessa and uh, Esteban, thank you. I think we'll get started it's now at one o'clock. So we'll, I think we'll, we know all our participants are here. So we'll get started. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, ESPO webinar. Um, ESPO is the acronym for the Interreg Europe project, which is efficient support services portfolio for SMEs. And it's, I mean, we don't need to add the importance really of SMEs in Europe at the moment. The SME strategy has just been published by the European Union. It talks about 25 million SMEs, 50% of EU GDP through SMEs, and two thirds of European jobs are provided by SMEs. So you can see that SMEs are very, very important. Um, and what we're going to do today is to address the challenge of what many people see as the insufficient impact and efficiency of policies which are aiming to enhance SME competitiveness, especially what we might call around three I's, internationalization, innovation, and impact. And today, this webinar will focus on the effectiveness of SME innovation support, but more importantly, we'll also look at possible solutions through some of the regions, through the partners' activities within the project. But before we go on, move on, I'd like to get pass over to Elzbieta Shazek from the Poznan, Poznan Science and Technology Park, and she'll give us a brief introduction to the project. So I hand over now to Elzbieta. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, that was the reason why we started the uh, ESPO project that we've seen a lot of investments being made into SME support. But uh, when we look at the macro scale, uh, trying to see the expected uh, growth of uh, GDP or, or even the indicators related with SMEs in given regions, the, it was not really uh, visible. That's why we wanted to, to focus on portfolio for, portfolios of policies. Even though in the reality, we wanted to bring real change uh, in what in our partner regions. That's why we focus on individual uh, instruments. And what we have done, we have asked uh, similar questions actually in, in each of the regions, even if the instruments were different and they were related first with uh, who are our uh, target? Are they really all SMEs or, or we wanted to, to target our instruments more precise? That it's really uh, focused on SMEs needs, so how we should uh, identify those needs and, and really understand them, not only talking about this, and how we should react to those needs. That was, uh, that, that were questions that each and every SME has its own situation and needs and the instruments are designed for the whole groups of it and we've done quite a bit of work on it and i hope that in this event we can share with what we have done and what we have learned in such a way that it's useful for completely new policy that it's needed now to recover um, the economy especially within smes in the post covid era we know uh, that everything will be changed. We don't know how, but still we need to prepare for it. So I hope that what we will be talking today will be useful for everyone. Thank you very much, Elspieta. Thank you very much for that brief introduction. Uh, I just want to now outline how the webinar will work. Um, there will be three parts. Uh, the first part, we will learn about sort of the current, current context with information from the Interreg program, and we're very pleased to have the director with us today um, from the Interreg Europe program. Uh, the second, then in the second part, we will examine concrete experiences on how to determine SME needs with specific references to regional innovation ecosystems and effective regional networks. And the final part we'll be using for specific solutions um, coming from our partner regions in the project to how we can actually improve the competitiveness of SMEs across Europe. So that will be three different sections. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, all people, like all the 
um, at attendees to keep their microphones and cameras switched off. This is to help to reduce the bandwidth and to make sure we don't get any noise coming through the system. But we will take questions through the, uh, the question and answer section. So those questions, if you write in your question, we will have uh, Tessa Anne, who's there behind this, will be taking some of those questions and looking at them, and we will try and ask the questions to at the end of each session. So there will be a question and answer session at the end of each session. Um, and if we can't answer all the questions um, uh, today because of time and various restraints, then these questions will be given to the speakers and they will be circulated to the participants. Just to say the conference is being recorded. Slides and recording will be available both on the URADA website and also on the ESPO website. So look out for that. And if you are signed up as a participant, you will get an email with the links after the conference. So um, before this session, we, we come to the first session. We do have a little piece of work for you, which is our first poll question. Um, if you could look at the screen, we'll come up with those a question and uh, um, survey we would like to raise, and then we will respond to give show the answers to that survey at the end of the session. So, Ivana. Yes, hello everyone. So today we have prepared a couple of polls to interact with you a bit more and to have an idea about your opinion on the topics we will be discussing today. The first poll is already on your screens. I will give you a minute to answer each poll. So this first one is about the current context of SME policies. Specifically, what level of importance do policies in your region place on the growth and development of SMEs? Please select just one. I can see that 17%, okay, 23% of you have voted already. So one being unimportant, two less important, three important, four extremely important, or five crucial. So please keep those responses coming in. You have 40, 15 seconds to go. And like Richard said, I will be sharing the results of this poll after the first session of speakers. All right, thank you very much, Richard. I return the floor to you. Thank you very much, Ivana. Uh, now, it's very great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, it's Erwin Sioris, who is the Interreg Europe Program Director. Erwin, I think you're there. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, and I think you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Oh, and I don't think we can hear you. Let's try this. You hear me now? Yes, we do. Thank you. Good, good, good. This is the standard question in all these uh, conferences. Do you hear me now? Good. <laughs> we all uh, go through our um, glitches uh, with these online conferences in these difficult times. And uh, first of all, thank you, um, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you, Richard, for passing me the floor and for inviting me for this important conference uh, you are carrying out in these difficult times. Uh, difficult times for all of us. Uh, most of uh, us are working still at home office. Um, same goes for our uh, office here for the program. And I appreciate, uh, first of all, very much the, uh, still that the partners still keep on going and implement um, the projects which are important uh, for all regions in Europe. As this is uh, an important uh, kind of final conference, as far as I understand, um, the presence of the JS is always um, kind of ensured. We uh, are here uh, at these conferences to uh, support you. Uh, also, it's part of our monitoring job. Um, we have so uh, look what is going on and um, as I said uh, we, we take note and we are available for questions uh, throughout the uh, session. For the uh, welcome I always allow me to uh, give you a quick overview where the program is and um, a few words on 
uh, summary what uh, how we regard the achievements uh, of the project uh, so far. So um, you have already a slide here um, on concerning the um, the achievements of the uh, projects. You see, we have uh, had four calls, and uh, which resulted in about 260 projects we are now uh, supporting. Um, important is um, not only the 260 projects, which is enormous work for our team, um, is that uh, 2,000, more than 2,000 partners are involved all over Europe in our program from all uh, countries of the program area. 90%, uh, almost 90% of all NATS2 regions, meaning regions, are involved in one or the other way in an Interreg Europe project. I think this is an enormous um, support or enormous figure showing that um, this program is important for the European region and therefore also deserves um, to have a future which member states now uh, also agreed on. A quarter of all partners we have in, in our project are managing authorities, also worth to mention, uh, which shows that uh, we were able to motivate managing authorities to be part of the program to ensure that funds, uh, bigger funds than Interact Europe can offer, are there to implement the exchange of experience, the good lessons learned uh, you found in Interact Europe project. Besides the project, we have also the policy learning platform. A quick word on the main services we offer. Uh, first of all, we uh, offer a community of pairs. About uh, 16,000 members we have already in, in the policy learning platform. All policymakers uh, from all levels in organizations, participants in our projects, but also people involved in other European projects. So this is an enormous source of knowledge we have in, in these projects. We have a, a good practice database, uh, more than 1,600, more than 1,500 projects are already in the good practice database. If we just go a slide back uh, to let the people better follow what I'm talking. One slide back, please. Yes, perfect. Uh, the good practice database gives us um, the good practices you as a project have identified. Uh, you forward them to us, we benchmark them with our experts and uh, everything which is regarded as innovative as be useful to be implemented in other parts of Europe is then uh, uploaded in this good practice database. So these are in a way uh, selected, well-picked good practices which are interesting for every part in Europe. The um, most important service I would say at the moment is uh, that we offer peer reviews. If a European region has a problem to solve uh, and needs support from other regions, found for example a good uh, practice in the database or two good practices which they want to implement as the uh, projects are not anymore available to be funded, the funds were all uh, gone. We offer the service that uh, regions from Europe can ask for help from the policy learning platform to find peers for a certain policy area. Our experts in the policy learning platform look what good examples we can uh, find in Europe, what good examples are already in our uh, projects and then trying to attract the regions which are part of the projects, so uh, practitioners in these um, regions to come to your region, the region need and we have a two, say, do, a two days intensive peer reviews with uh, depending three, four or five regions, other regions in Europe and we analyze the situation of the region in need. We uh, allow the other regions, the pair, to share their experience, to uh, discuss in close cooperation with the level uh, concerned, so uh, the policy level, but also the level uh, of the implementers in the region. So you speak, we allow 
that reach and speak with um, partners from the same level, speak the same language, have the same problems. We bring these people together and uh, all this closes after a two days event with an action plan, a kind of roadmap to solve uh, the problems uh, they have. So we found this, this is uh, quite successful. We get extremely good positive feedback from these peer reviews we have and the calls are open. Please have a look if you are interested to be part of such a peer review. Uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, the policy learning platform. The next slides gives an overview where we are uh, about our uh, implementation. Uh, you see that uh, we have about half of the projects uh, have closed the phase one of uh, the project and you see on the figures uh, that uh, 72, around 70% 70 of the outputs and achievements we uh, have envisaged are already um, reached with only half of the projects uh, in this final stage. Uh, I think this is also a good uh, figure uh, for anyone um, who wants to support and promote Interreg Europe, especially when it comes to a future. The next slide uh, gives an even more important uh, figure because it shows um more or less the, the kind of impact what the projects have we have um 330 about 330 policy changes already uh, noted implemented in uh, 115 projects and as we always asked uh, how much money do you invest in implementing this good policy uh, solutions uh, we found here that with this uh, 115 projects where we have action plans analyzed and uh, seen, um, they envisage to invest uh, 500 million euros in the implementation of the good practices they have learned from the uh, Interreg Europe projects. If you compare this now with the amount of money which Interreg Europe has invested, 150 uh, to 500 uh, million euro, you have a leverage effect of more than three, about 3.5. That means one euro invested in an Interreg Europe project results in about 3.5 euro uh, invested due to the policy changes envisaged. So this is quite an interesting number, especially for uh, financial people, um, the yield, uh, the leverage effect, and I think um, another argument to continue Interreg Europe. Let's come to the uh, theme on the next slide. Um, the project is supporting, supporting the competitiveness of SMEs. We have um, 66, projects which are dealing in the uh, same domain and business support and in the next slide I would like to uh, summarize a little bit what the project uh, achieved so far. First of all um, the ESPO project was able to uh, get Airmark picked about half of their good practices submitted to the policy learning platform as I uh, mentioned earlier we analyze the good practices we receive from the projects. Uh, the external experts have a look and they found uh, half of the good practices good and they are part now of the policy learning platform available for all parts of Europe and then also being a big support for uh, all other regions in Europe. Um, they have also uh, a uh, pilot action on uh, innovative SMEs uh, carrying on. Uh, this is an interesting uh, tool uh, or an interesting test we want to see. Uh, looking forward to see uh, the results. My colleagues also told me that uh, they successfully did a self-assessment tool uh, implemented um, how to measure the competitiveness of uh, SMEs. Um, we have uh, two uh, policy changes implemented. 
And uh, furthermore, my colleagues also uh, mentioned the active participation of the lead partner and the partners in Interreg Europe events. So, uh, ESPO is a, a good example of how a project should be implemented, how the results are uh, extracted, and how uh, the project uh, supports other regions even beyond their core project activities. On the next slides, a few words on the uh, COVID challenges and the solution Interreg Europe uh, tries to provide. So, um, as I mentioned already, we have the large community. Uh, here's it, the figures even updated uh, 17,000 members now in the community of uh, Interreg Europe, uh, which uh, was already mentioned earlier in the policy learning uh, platform slide. Uh, what we have, we have uh, a new uh, COVID-19 sections on our website, which includes uh, good practices from all over Europe uh, to mitigate the pandemic's effects. So have a look on our website. Um, we plan and have online thematic activities, which uh, gives also a helping hand to regions in need. Uh, the policy learning platform provides tailor support uh, with the uh, experts which are available to be called on. And uh, we also have events and news uh, on uh, the COVID-19 uh, challenges. Uh, we had already a webinar on it and uh, further will come. So uh, have a closer look to our website, look what is going on and uh, profit from uh, the experience, the other projects gathered uh, with this crisis. Last word on uh, the future. You all know that the project, uh, the program was not mentioned in the draft regulation, uh, in the first draft regulation the European Commission uh, published in May. Uh, fortunately, to the uh, huge support of the regions in Europe, you in a way, the projects, the European Parliament, but also the uh, Council, meaning the member states, uh, they all pushed that Interreg Europe is back in the game and, game and yes, and now it's confirmed, we are back in the regulation, Interreg Europe will continue. Um, we, uh, based on this, the partner state started the preparation of the EU program. We had already a number of programming committees. The last just uh, two weeks ago, uh, the next will be end of September. And um, we're preparing actively a program which at the moment uh, seems to be an evolution but not a revolution to the current program. So we will continue. Most likely the member states agree that the project should continue in also uh, to be seen if they exactly uh, will look like they look at the moment. Uh, the policy learning platform services will continue also. This um, seems to be um, the wish of the partner states. So this is proposed and uh, will be uh, discussed on. And um, as I said, we will do a few changes, uh, but uh, not a revolution. What we still don't know is um, the budget. Here we still need uh, the support from all of you, from the regions, from uh, regional level. If you have contact to the national level, to European parliaments, uh, use the links you have, you have. We need to support, you need to ensure a budget which should be uh, of course, from our point of view, um, about the same as we have at the moment. Um, we do not ask for more. We are well aware that the budget uh, decreases. Uh, there are uh, challenges which Europe faces. But if we have more or less the amount which has been provided in the current period, if we can keep this amount, uh, would be already a big success. So I ask for your support uh, for this. And for the um, conference, I wish you um, all the best. I'm will following uh, the introductory session. If you have questions, 
uh, let me know and for the implementation of the rest pro of the project uh, all the best Richard, well, thank you respect to you uh, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the, the fact you've congratulated the, the project. Um, that, that's very good for the, our participants. I'd now like to move on to, it's a great pleasure to introduce the former director of URADA, Christian Soublance, who's going to give us what was going to be, is the, in a way, a keynote introduction to the conference. Christina, I think you need to unmute. Christian, we cannot hear you. We do not hear you. No sound at all, Christian. Okay. We cannot hear you at all. Richard, shall we switch between Elisabetta and Christian? Um, yes, if El Pieter is available, um, possibly Christian can find his sound in a minute, but we go straight to El Pieter if she's available. Elzbieta, sorry to bring you on a bit earlier, but we're having problems with the sound for Christian. So we're bringing you forward if you can do a short presentation. Thank you very much. Alberto, can you run my presentation if possible? Oh, yes. Okay, uh, I've said already a few words about ESPO and thought uh, about uh, even a shorter message, but once again, if I can show you on the slide why we say effective portfolios. Next slide. Uh, ESPO stands for Efficient Support Services Portfolio for SMEs. Uh, and why we started all of this? Because uh, uh, we have seen that uh, for years and years a lot of money has been invested in SME support uh, on each level, European Commission, regions, uh, countries. Uh, but even though each of the support measures can uh, show real results in the SMEs that they supported, uh, if you would like to see at the results on macro level, which is uh, growth of the regions, uh, revival of the common economy, or even uh, indicators that are related with uh, SMEs, those results are not visible. So we were, our idea was to work on a well-coordinated portfolios that its policy mixes, that uh, will not go for uh, SMEs as a whole, uh, but uh, well-defined target group, in which individual change in SME will make a synergetic impact on the whole region's competitiveness. In practice, as Interreg Europe uh, started to, to, to underline, uh, we wanted also to make change in each of the regions that are participating in the ESPA, and you will get, let them, get them know uh, later on. Uh, we, we focus on concrete instruments. Actually, it was probably not possible anywhere to work on the whole portfolio at, uh, um, as a whole uh, and that meant specific approach for each of instrument and each instrument was a bit different uh, so on the next slide uh, I would like to just show you 
that while working, we exchange what we have done and the good practices, and the questions that we have asked and tried to, to find an answer probably will be important also for, 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 for you. First question that we asked, okay, how to recognize the needs of SMEs? We all talk about the needs of SMEs, but, uh, but we looked for, for real um, answer. Um, we work on, on questionnaires and individual approach, and you will learn about this later. Then we, we, we thought, okay, we, we, we want to reach the right SMEs for our policy, so how to identify that this SME is, uh, is belonging to this group, uh, how to make the support understandable and accessible to every SME, because those are agencies or policymakers we are working with, uh, with a portfolio of instruments with its own jargon, but when you ask SMEs uh, whether they do understand them, normally they don't. So we, 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 we discussed how to make it really accessible. Then the answer were in networks and you will uh, learn about them. And how to organize a flexible support service that is adapted to single SMEs needs within ERDF. Our experience is that ERDF is rather very uh, tough with the with the requirements with procedures but each SME has its completely different situation and actually we've found some answers related both with networks and vouchers and then how to recognize the effect of the support because uh, again we will have the same problem I do believe that that the, what we will show uh, will be an input into the discussion on how uh, SME support should be in the post-COVID area. Maybe not so much on the very emergency issues, but in the time that, that will now come, that we will see that a lot of economy and customers will change. So I hope uh, some of the answers we will find right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Elisabetta. Um, we're hoping that was useful actually to look at this more concrete and this level of granularity you might need to look at individual SMEs and their problems. We might come back now to a more broader approach to how this might be looked at. If Christian, I'm not sure if Christian is now available and he's got the mic working. Hello, can you hear me yes. now? Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for appreciating that. <laughs> Okay, so um, I will try to think about what can be the post-COVID uh, era for challenge for SME, but also for the type of support that they need. Next slide, please. So I will try to rem remind you about the impact, but also how to better identify the enterprise segment and to adapt the support service for it. I have no conclusion. This is why the last slide will be about food for thought. Next slide. Uh, it's one, two, quickly, I think. Yeah. The starting point of the reflection is that there is no doubt that the COVID has a major impact for the socioeconomic tissue of every region. But at the same time, there has been a lot of uh, recovery plans set at national EU level and, of course, region, so that we should try to make sure that policymakers don't cut uh, into the regional effort in R&D. Because even if you want to recover, you need to be innovative. And the past experience show us that uh, the crisis provides market opportunities and the winners will be those who are in innovative and also first market uptakers. Next slide. This is just to show uh, what are currently the top-down EU policy to steer the post-COVID years. And they are a mix of relaunch of the economy and, of course, the agenda we were drafted before the crisis, like the Green Deal, the digital agenda, and also the new industrial policy. So you have really a, a, a legitimacy to lobby for more flexibility and uh, also to ask to keep the S3. 
Next slide, please. Just an illustration about what the initiatives are targeting, and it goes from SME to uh, rural area and also the more poverty actions, and of course, about research and development. Next slide. So the impact to the enterprise has direct ones and indirect. It goes from sales, cash, and at the end, if there is lost profits, profits, there is a risk that the investment capacity of the enterprise may be reduced. So it's important to keep the agenda for uh, research and innovation into uh, the, the plan. Next slide, please. So the options of the enterprise to get out of the crisis should be the signal for public support services. The company has to reimagine their action plan, so to, to recover and to have uh, revenues. They have to scan the post-crisis opportunities. We have seen, for instance, that uh, e-commerce has been booming, but also other opportunities can, can, can go on. Probably people have also to learn from the crisis what has been wrong, uh, and that can be changed, especially, I believe, in the supply chain, and especially if you have uh, enterprise in your regions with mono suppliers, this is important to change. And also to look to what are the possible resilience capacity of, of uh, the SME. Uh, are they already back to business as normal, or are they just waiting uh, to customers to come because they have deferred the investment during the crisis. Next slide, please. What should be the possible response for a regional development agency or an innovation agency? So look to really a new segmentation of enterprise based on the effect of the crisis, either because they are market dependency and they have turnover and stuff, or just make a health check. Maybe that a lot of enterprise uh, Unfortunately, are nearly bankrupt, but on the same time, you can find agile one who will be the potential new winners. And to do the best support, you have to reimagine the regional competitiveness, how it will be in the future by developing new scenarios, updating the analysis of the enterprise need, and of course, to prepare for the war for new position in the new economic world with new competitive advantage. Next slide, please. So for LEA, it's important to rebalance the nature of the support services to, that they offer. What's the good balance between infrastructure, coaching, advice, networking, matchmaking? To have a, a new offer, and in the new offer, I believe very much it will be about counseling, intelligence, coaching, and uh, mentoring. And a new public intervention there also to have much more focus on matchmaking. We've seen a lot of regions and cluster immediately put in place a platform to exchange uh, different knowledge or, or even uh, materials between the companies, what will be uh, the access for funding? So can you imagine a new crowd lending platform? Uh, the FinTech has uh, some success, or why not, especially for the smaller companies in, in your cities or region to analyze the feasibility of a local enterprise currency? And I would like you to, to look to the WEAR in Switzerland, we exist since 1934, uh, yeah, 34, uh, on this thing, and which has been very uh, successful. And of course, to rethink the interregional cooperation focus, especially in the terms of uh, supply chain. Next one, please. So you have to have another system to take decision, and inside the RDA or at the regional level, to split uh, in two 
different teams. One, which is the operations team, who have to bring back information about what is the situation. And another team, which is uh, more on insight, what is the next? If the policymakers have hypothesis, what can be the scenario? And I believe that this time, uh, even uh, if Interact is about sharing, learn for sharing your best practice, learn from mistakes and mismatches, uh, which has been spotted during the crisis. Avoid to look backwards. Uh, oh, the, the past was glorious, but instead work on transformative ambitions. And last but not least, propose simple and easy to understand uh, delivery mechanism. Next slide. So there it's how to mix the options for enterprise and the option for yourself. So go back to the segmentation according to the COVID-19 impact, but you could do it also uh, like the agility for innovation. Look to the evaluation of your support services or your consultancy services. What is ineffective, neutral or efficient in the way you have to propose the services in the post-crisis uh, period? And especially, to try to improve the customer relation and search for new market opportunities. And that's go for the enterprise, but goes also for the people in charge of economic development in the region. Next slide, please. So the best thing is to do a quick agenda. What can be made this week, in the next three weeks, next month and quarter? And always reassess the starting position. Uh, and, and to look to the short-term demand either by the company or yourself and the scanning of opportunities. Yeah, next slide, please. So this is my last one and the food for turf. How can you mobilize regional human capital and assets to be engaged with SME to reshape the regional support services? Continue to fight for a strong research and development agenda. Adapt the regional vision to new realities. Maybe in a few months, 25% uh, 20, of your SME will die. So what can you do to identify the new winning partners? Still be agile to react to emerging opportunities, but also be prepared if there is a possible unexpected event and finally imagine new interregional forms of collaboration to share the risk to support industrial transformation the digitalization or the green solution so maybe uh, there are more ideas to come some of them are maybe not really in your influence remit so look to it and think about even better ideas or solutions. So that was the message to introduce the debate of today. Thank you. Christian, thank you very much as usual for an excellent uh, presentation. Very, very good overview of sort of the current discussion points. And I, I take your point, there is no conclusion at the moment. There's lots of food for thought, how we act. Uh, we will have some possibilities of a uh, quick question and answer, but before we move to the question and answer that Tessa is having a look at, I'd like to come back to Ivana, who's going to give us the poll results from our first poll. Yes. So for this poll, we received responses from 66% of today's participants. From this, 38% say that policies in their region view the growth and development of SMEs as important while 19% say that they are crucial and only 2% say they are unimportant. So Richard and Tessa, I return the floor to you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I think that we were hopefully expecting that from people who are interested in the SME debate today. Tessa, do we have any questions for the three speakers? Um, I have a remark and two questions for Mr. Siveris, if he's still there. 
So uh, first of all, it's my colleague Esteban who's saying uh, thank you for giving us the vision of the leveraging effect of the budget with the amounts invested via Interact. Um, and he would like to know what is, um, let me see, um, questions are keeping coming in. So my screen is jumping all over the place. I'm sorry. This is in here. So the how will the Interreg Euro program in the next programming period be? Are there any changes for 2021-27? And will policy learning be still supported? And also the better management of ERDF? What about that in the next programming period? Yeah, you. you can hear me? Yeah, we yes, can. We can. Good. Uh, yeah, thank you for all these questions. Um, this is what we discussed at the moment with the partner states. As I mentioned already, uh, we plan um, no revolution. Uh, the member states think that what we have done in the current period should in principle be kept. They are happy what uh, we do and that's also what we uh, hear from the regions uh, and from the stakeholders on the European level. Uh, they like the projects, they like the policy learning platform. So in principle, this should be continued. Um, at the moment, what I said already, we do not know yet um, if the projects in the future will look the same. There's a five year period or will they be shorter? Will we have uh, pilot actions already earlier than uh, in the current period where we say pilot actions principle only after the first phase? Uh, will there be two phases to be discussed uh, further with the partner states? For the policy learning platform, also here, um, the member states uh, asked that the peer review will be kept. Um, we will see uh, what of the other services will be kept. Maybe we will not keep all the services the policy learning platform has at the moment. This has to be further analyzed and further discussed with the partner state. But again, um, count that the program will more or less continue in the future as uh, we do now the implementation. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. We have a, a question for Christian. Um, somebody is wondering, what do you think, Christian, about the idea of re-industrialized Re-industrializing, re I'm sorry, our territories to be sure that we have resilient economies. Do you think it could be an excuse to subsidies, uh, subsidize non-profitable businesses? They're asking. Would it not be a way to erode the internal market? Yeah, that's a danger, but it's depending what the people believe are the essential to avoid a new crisis. So we have seen that we were missing a lot of pharmaceutics capability and capacities or even textile for the mask. So what is really essential uh, at European level to rebring inside Europe? But you have already seen uh, when you listen, um, I'm not making any mention to a car industry or an airline, when they ask their state to refunding with 9 billion euro, don't tell me they have lost 9 billion euro in three months. So the reset is indeed. Okay. Do we have time for one more um, for Christian? A uh, quick question. Okay. So uh, related to the food for thought, Christian, what do you think are the winning factors for SMEs? E-commerce, raw materials? It depends on the situation of your company. Some had advantage now and they have lost it. Or the winners for me are the people who will be the first to imagine a new business model. And digitalization is probably one part of the answer, but finding new niche market is probably also another solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Yeah, thank you very much for Tessa Anna for the questions as well. We're now going to move um, to the second session. Uh, this is how to address the needs of SMEs uh, post-COVID. 
we have three speeches. The session will examine two key aspects, how we identify and address the real needs of SMEs and the identification of specific target groups to obtain policies that can be replicable to specific segments, which is important that we can share some of the policies between segments. Our three speakers are Vaido Mikain from Tartu Science Park, uh, Nathalie Boulanger from uh, the, uh, the region Centre Val de Loire, and then we have uh, finally Desislava Koleva from Gabrolo, who will be talking there about an SME area that they've been looking at a survey. Before we hand over to uh, our speakers, can I ask uh, Ivana to post up the second poll? Yes, so the second poll should be on your screens already. The question is, after the COVID-19 pandemic, which in your opinion are the top three main necessities of European SMEs? It should be noted that the options you are seeing were also presented in the Commission's SME strategy for a sustainable and digital Europe. This was published back in March of this year. So um, these are the key elements that could improve European SME's competitiveness. Um, however, if you think there are other issues that will need to be addressed, please don't hesitate to write them down in the comments section and my colleagues will later read it during the Q&A part of the program. So I see that 32% of you have voted. Please keep on voting. Um, as usual, I will present the results of this poll in a few minutes. So back to you, Richard. Yes, uh, just Ivana, you can vote, just to make the check, you can vote for as many of those options as possible, right? You, it's yes. not just one vote. You can, yes. you can vote more than once on different options. Okay, thanks very much. Well, we'll come back to the exciting results which will come up soon. But now uh, we we're into our second session and it's a great pleasure that I'd like to introduce uh, Vaido Mikain from Tartu Science Park, who's going to provide a vision of the relevance of their SME policies in Tartu. Vaido, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to see that uh, there are so many of you who are who have decided to spend this beautiful Monday with uh, policies and SME instruments. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a tricky part to start uh, as a second person because now I'm still thinking about what Christian presented and and said and and partially also what Erwin said. So. Uh, just a quick reflection from my side uh, and if uh, we can move back a couple of slides on my presentation it seems that we are on the first slide <laughs> then uh, then uh, I, I just read in the morning one article when there was a quote from military general about crises and war situations and uh, and the question was that or the claim was that at the beginning of the war or at the beginning of the crisis everybody gets it wrong it's just a question about who gets it right first, who manages to kind of get a clear picture of the situation. So I, I really liked Christian's uh, kind of uh, thought about uh, reimagining re uh, the current uh, ecosystem and competitiveness and everything. But uh, to my story, and um, as, as Christian's, I will leave you with food for thought and a couple of um, ideas and and perhaps a little bit context of where, where we come. We come, or Tartu Science Park comes as El Spieta is from Science Park, from Poznan Day, Tartu Us. We are working with the companies and on this grassroots level every day. Uh, we have uh, more than around 100 in our programs and in our premises, and this is our connection to the companies. And Alberto, you can move on to the next slide. And uh, the situation in Tartu is that we are somewhat blessed. We have actually managed to get the working triple helix model. The, those who don't remember what it was, it's on the slide, uh, where the government, university and the industry actually agree on something. And in our case, we have 11 higher educational institutions in Tartu. Uh, we have quite an adequate industry and we have a very cooperative uh, city government. So on municipal level, we are doing really well. Plus, we have startup-minded citizens, and uh, well, we have developing environmental consciousness. We still have some work to do. And as a bonus element, we have an ample abundance of uh, support organizations. 
Uh, next slide, Alberto, please. But um, I would like to bring out one concrete use case that we are running about this triple helix. And um, this is a European Space Agency business incubator that uh, we are leading. We have 11 companies in there, so not too many. We have provided 250k investment and the companies itself or themselves have raised another 1.2 million and they have created 41 workplaces. What is kind of uh, important on this slide is that while in absolute numbers this is a relatively small scale example, if you look at the round bubble there, then uh, these are the involved stakeholders, involved organizations. There are city governments, there are universities, there are private venture bodies, there are companies, there are support organizations. So the picture itself, even on small cases, is very complex. And uh, I think this is uh, part of the, I wouldn't say problem, but part of the reality where we are living in today. So let's move forward. And. Uh, uh, one slide back, please. Yes, this one. About the bubbles and policies and uh, the support measures. Uh, as actually Erwin presented, there is an abundance, I would even say overabundance of good practices and policies. And, uh, and if you ask different stakeholders and different parties, what do they think about the policies? Are our current policies good for those who we are supporting or who they are meant to support? Well, I will leave you with that question. Um, we in Tartu, we did ask from our companies, uh, because as a support organization and business support organizations, as the name indicates, we should exist for the SMEs. And um, the answer was relatively uncomfortable for us. So um, that I will just leave you with that question and move on to my uh, last, almost last slide. Actually, there is one more, but, but my takeaway message to you today is that uh, the current crisis has provided us a unique opportunity to initiate meaningful dialogue with the companies that now we are seriously asking the companies that what do you need and, and what is it that bothers you and they are actually replying so uh, let's take this opportunity and uh, and go through ourselves the entrepreneurial discovery process as policymakers and business support organizations what we tell companies to do every day that to find your customers, talk to the customers, uh, know your customer. Uh, I think we as uh, policymakers and support organizations do not know that that well. So uh, this is my like request or plea to you that uh, let us do the same that we ask to do from our companies. And uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions or if any of this resonated, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Yeah, Vaido, thank you very much. I thought it was very interesting, your last point about this post-COVID has a unique opportunity to create a dialogue that perhaps was more difficult in the past. Um, so well done on that. It was very good. And this is an opportunity now, as you said, this entrepreneurial discovery process, perhaps there's something that we can start to look at in a, in a different way. Thank you very much for that. We'd now like to move on to our second speaker. Um, and it's great pleasure to welcome, um, to welcome Nathalie uh, Boulanger from the Regional Development Agency uh, DEVA uh, in the region Centre Val de Loire. And she's gonna explain the role of the agency coordinating all the regional intermediaries of the region. So Nathalie, I hope you're there. And I think you're going to start with a short video. Yeah, so the following video is going to illustrate uh, how uh, the public authorities have developed uh, supportive measures to tackle the COVID-19 crisis and how coordination between uh, the different regional intermediaries have uh, set up. You are also uh, going to discover uh, the already concrete results in terms of adaptation of the of the public policy to the company needs and adjust support actions. So Alberto, if you can launch a video. In Centre Val de Loire, the ecosystem supporting the regional economy has very rapidly coped with the emergence of the pandemic.
The support ecosystem is mainly the network of economic developers coordinated by DevUp. The members belong to the regional public and parapublic organizations in charge of economic and technological development. Since the beginning of the sanitary crisis, the economic developers have been immediately set to work to collect the company's needs and difficulties and to inform them about the measures implemented to overcome these new challenges. After the two-month lockdown, DevUp focused on a panel of companies that are considered as locally strategic. The aim is to gather their needs and their good practices for their economic recovery. 1,800 regional companies were surveyed by the economic developers on the basis of a common questionnaire with open and closed questions. In addition, the surveys have been capitalized in the shared database of the network according to strict confidentiality rules. In addition to the interviews conducted directly with the companies, DevUp, as the coordinator of the network, also collected feedback from all of the intermediaries. Every week, DevUp wrote a summary note based on the company's questionnaires and the feedback from the intermediaries to report the real-time insights of the regional economic situation to the state and regional authorities. Based on this real-time feedback, the weekly analysis enables to adjust the operational measures to the difficulties identified. Moreover, and to facilitate the economic developers' work to spread the information about the various public measures, DEVA publishes weekly a very complete information board. From the interviews, it appeared that the critical condition to restart the economic activity was to provide personal protective equipment to any employee in the region. This list of initiatives illustrate the strong mobilization of the entire regional ecosystem joining forces in emergency to get through the COVID-19 crisis. This joint involvement, coordinated by DEVUP, delivered a quick and effective answer to both the businesses and the decision makers. These actions ensure the viability and pave the way to the recovery. So, uh, as you have seen, uh, several measures have been quickly implemented in Central Val de Loire region in France to ensure the long term survival of the region businesses uh, and uh, to encourage their recovery under the best conditions. But this first series of actions um, aim to provide uh, immediate and short term support to strengthen. Uh, crisis uh, re response capacities and to enable workers and enterprise to weather the storm. Now we are starting to prepare the ground for recovery. In particular, the policymakers decided to focus on restoring labor markets and uh, to support workers and enterprise. Indeed, uh, DevUp, uh, which is a regional economic development agency, was asked to work on specific client journey uh, dedicated to relocation of strategic activities, to the supply chain securities, and to the diversification strategy. First, once again, we are exploiting the interviews made during the COVID-19 crisis in order to detect uh, which companies are already implemented or intend to implement it, uh, a strategy for recovery and which are the main challenges faced to do that. Then we are going to work with the other intermediaries and especially those uh, which focus on the industrial recovery to propose the best support that meets company needs. Uh, for us, now uh, the main challenge is to, to coordinate all the different support that will be provided in our region in order to maintain the efficiency of the political, of the public policy, sorry, and uh, to align the regional policy with the European opportunities such as recovery, uh, recovery plan, the Green Deal and Horizon for Europe. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. I think that we, you picked up again on this thing that um, Christian mentioned, this operational team, uh, and something that Vaido also mentioned, this need to open up a dialogue, and the speed of which you did that um, was is, is very good. It shows that they, this is a very, very good example of acting fast and bringing in this new dialogue and looking at new opportunities. Um, so this is something what we've often said is never waste a crisis. You know, this, this is an opportunity also of looking at um, getting in contact with your SMEs very fast. I'd like now to move over, uh, move on to our final speaker in this session, which is Desislava Koleva from Gabovo, from Bulgaria. And she's going to provide an example of a survey that they've recently done on their SMEs, which brings in some interesting reading of what are the effects on the SMEs in her region um, from the post-COVID uh, crisis. So over to you, uh, Tessislava. Thank you, Richard. Uh, welcome to everybody to the final conference of ESPO. It is our pleasure to present Gabro Municipality centrally located in Bulgaria. How Gabrovo is keeping high uh, on the changes of SMEs uh, in the post-COVID era. I will ask Alberto to put my presentation online because I cannot see it. Uh, just to say some words for the actions uh, we have taken from the beginning of uh, the new year. We started a new programming period uh, for Bulgaria and uh, we directly jumped to the new approaches uh, in this dynamic situation. We have uh, done new social economic analysis and uh, we have done new investment profile with the support of the Institute of Market Research. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes we yes. can. Can I share my presentation? It's not listed any, uh, I, and I cannot see it. We see your presentation and we hear you. But I cannot see my presentation, sorry. I will go ahead. So um, new approaches in dynamic situation is a big um, inquiry from the companies because the municipalities is staying very close to the companies. And uh, we have to take our measures uh, on a local level and also on national level to overcome uh, the, the challenges of COVID-19. And we have done a big SME online survey developed with the Institute of Market Research. In fact, uh, the survey uh, is uh, working with all the questions to the companies uh, regarding the number of employees, the exports, uh, the productivity of the companies, the main factors uh, which uh, that hinder the activity of the companies, and also the main problems of uh, finding staff and uh, what kind of investments companies intend to do in the next years. The main section of this uh, SME survey is uh, focused on uh, effects of COVID-19. And in fact, uh, we have uh, 55 uh, large and medium companies participating in the survey. And we have 67% uh, uh, of companies which declared decline of revenues in March and April uh, and the, the last two months as well. 45 of the experts uh, uh, of the companies uh, expect a long-term effect and uh, profound change in some supply chain and also relationship with external partners. 53% uh, introduced some form of uh, teleworking in March and April uh, 2020 and 51% indicate that their workers took advantages of the annual pet uh, leave during the state of emergency. 20% laid off workers and 75 expect to retain staff by the end of 2020. I'm sorry, but because I cannot see any, anything of my presentation, I have just speak all the time. And uh, I want to say that uh, at the end, uh, because I have just five minutes to present uh, the actions, uh, cities and municipalities are quite important and they play a very important role uh, in connection to the companies and to react to their needs. Thank you for your attention. The presentation will be available for you. Uh, um, thanks, Maria. I think hopefully, I don't know if um, uh, Albert, Alberto can put up your final slide um, where you have the figures. I don't know, Alberto, if we could just show that last slide. Um, because, uh, not, Richard, sorry, but the presentation was not 
So for me, it's in down the time. So thank you so much. This is the this is the slide, um, Desislava, I think, which is interesting, um, where you mentioned the 67% of decline in revenues, um, but also the no no notion of teleworking coming in. I think that's interesting. Um, and then you, we can see some of the challenges coming up from that on, on that level. So I think there was a very interesting slide and part, but you can, um, if we ask our participants for later, you can actually get these slides in more depth after the, the program. So thank you very much, Desislava. But I'd like to ask now if we can go to our poll results with um, Ivana. Yes. So for this poll, we received responses from 49% of today's participants. As expected, access to finance is viewed as the most important necessity with 81% of votes, followed by the digitalization of process with 72%. And finally, something we didn't expect is a tie for third place between attracting customers and improved collaboration with SME networks with 40%. Um, I should also mention that related to the Commission's SME strategy, URADA has written a position paper about this, which will soon be available in our website. So if you're interested, just visit URADA's website and click on the position papers tab. So Richard, do you have any comments? I return the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Obviously, we would expect the access to finance and the digitalization as being key, key aspects of that. But um, I'd like to go over to Tessa Anne. Do we have any um, questions for our three panelists? No, Richard, I didn't get any questions for this session. It's a pity, but in the end, it's not so bad because we're 10 minutes on delay already. So okay. I would propose well, we continue. Okay, well, thanks very much for the prompt of keep moving on. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we're going to move now to our final session. And this is moving from looking at the needs, looking at the challenges, moving to solutions and lessons from some of the regional partners. Um, and so we will look at some success examples of measures that could be adopted to support the competitiveness of SMEs. And these measures, could, of course, can be used in different regions and, and different segments. So before introducing the speakers, I'd just like to ask for Ivana to come back with the final poll question. Yeah. Um, based on what Richard said, this last session, we'll talk about specific solutions to improve the competitiveness of SMEs. Um, like the previous poll, please don't forget that you are supposed to take three choices. So please um, start putting in your choices. The question is, which are the top three most important measures to guarantee the long-term survival of European SMEs? Is it harmonization of fiscal systems among EU member states? Adoption of more innovative public procurement methods? Spread of new technologies such as AI or big data management? Furthering the green transition or extension of the digital innovation hubs network? Um, like with previous polls, I will be sharing the results after the session. So I will be closing the polls in a few seconds. So please keep voting. All right. So thank you. Um, back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Ivan. We'll look forward to hearing from you at the end of this session. We'd now like to go on to our, um, we have six speakers in this um, section. And our first speaker is uh, who you've already met. Um, and it's a great welcome to welcome back, Elzbiet Shazek. Uh, um, and she was going to talk about support instruments for stakeholders involving living labs. So over to you, Elsa Bethieta. Elzbeta, we cannot hear you. She, you seem to be muted, Elspeta. Um, 
apologies for for a bit of delay actually i would like to share with a process that we tried to do in espo and actually it was uh, applying the living lab in uh, preparing and designing an sme support instrument in the region of wielkopolska in poland can i ask the next slide uh, Actually, perhaps uh, for, for most of you, Living Lab is uh, somehow connected with using, use, well, asking the user to, to participate in design of some products, usually tangible ones, that, that in more or less real life environment, they, they can use the, um, the new product or, or the prototype why we have done it for the policy instrument. Uh, I can show you in a very few words how we have done it and perhaps if you are interested we can share with the methodologies that we use even though it was an experiment and, and there are quite a few lessons on how to improve it. Next slide please. Uh, first of all, we asked ourselves who are the users of a policy instrument and as uh, we all are talking now, um, SMEs should be the users of the instrument, but perhaps somehow in between the lines of Vido, you can see that there are interests uh, of other institutions or actors that have their own agenda related with the specific instruments or policies, so that we said that the users, of course, ISMEs, but also regional authorities, intermediaries, researchers, and agency, etc. And we uh, ask them all to to be uh, together to say what do they expect and try to understand each other. Next slide. We we used uh, quite a fashionable method of. Uh, of uh, design thinking, which we understand Living Lab is design thinking with user and try to, to get as much of, uh, of uh, testing as possible with the user and change the instrument with them. So, of course, we, we've, we try to uh, understand uh, the needs by, by empathy maps and, uh, and personas. Uh, to distill what are the most important points that our instruments want to answer to. And then we, we, we made out of it a kind of a brief requirement specification what the instrument should be in order to meet the, the needs of all of the instrument users. Next slide, please. Uh, then we looked for inspirations that we've got from other, other partners and we have done some first concepts of, uh, made by, by, by the participants of, of our workshops. Uh, and on next slide, uh, I can tell you that uh, those ideas uh, went with different ways. So what we, we tried to do, we wanted to do as much as testing as possible. So we, we discussed those concepts, tried to, to help uh, all of the participants of the process to, to look um, uh, very much uh, critically to the concept. But I can tell you that when we made a kind of prototype alpha, you can see on the pictures, it's a, it's a kind of a storyboard with pictures and so very little text that, that show step by step uh, how the instrument works. It was much easier to the user, especially SMEs who didn't understand the language that other actors use uh, in why talking about policy instruments, the, the name policy instrument was even difficult. This uh, prototype, uh, we call them prototype alpha because this is just a storyboard, was crucial uh, to make it really improved and improved because every, it was like a common language for everyone. So uh, what, what we can share is how we, um, made the, uh, the, the book for, for Living Labs that actually was made in, in, in Bosnia uh, on some series of meetings and steps to do uh, within, uh, within our process. And what we think that could be taken and shared with all of you is that uh, all the instruments that I, we are using now in Europe are, have long time history that uh, you and, and the users, the, the beneficiaries know 
uh, how they work. But now, if you want to change, change the instruments, we have also the risk of how they are understood and whether they are really uh, efficient with, with our beneficiaries. So I think that, that using this living lab approach, we can shorten uh, and the time from, from the, the recognition of needs to having good prototype of an instrument and we have better chances that it will really work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bozbieta. That's very interesting of how we move from the use of sort of a living lab and uh, storyboards for policy communication was uh, very interesting. How we move fast from policy to implementation is uh, very, very useful. I'd like to now move on to our next speaker. And uh, just to say we're going into Spain and we welcome Juan Garate from Technalia in the Basque Country. And he's going to look at digital transformation and uh, the way of revamping the tourist industry. And just to say that Spain has opened its borders, I think. So you're all welcome to go as a tourist, I think. So over to you, Juan, five minutes. Juan, I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. No, we still can't hear you. No. Juan, um, we can't see, I can't see you and I, we can't hear you. I can see him, but I cannot hear him, unfortunately. <laughs> No, still not. Fine. No. No. Should we move on? Possibly while we can think, trying to solve the technical problems for one. Should we move to Beatrice? Possibly if, if, if Beatrice is available. Okay. And then Juan can try to solve the sound problem. Okay. Go to the next. Yes, okay. So Beatrice, if you're there, it's, I'd like to introduce it's Beatrice Casado from ICE and it's Castilla y Leon, not far away from the Basque country. Thank you very much for stepping in. Um, and she's going to look at some of the initiatives to provide technological support uh, to enterprises, mainly in rural areas. So it's an interesting area of looking at. So Beatrice, over to you. Can you hear me? So uh, first of all, hope you are staying safe. Uh, I think it's the most important thing by now. And congratulations to the organizers. And thank you very much for inviting us as speakers. I will address this issue talking about three main things. Who are we and which is our strategy, our approach. A very concrete program that has been our action plan in the context of ESPO and cooperation. So we always uh, begin our talks. Please move to the next slide uh, with this message. Castilla Leon is a very huge uh, region. In fact, it's the third biggest region at the European Union. We are bigger than 60 member states, only you have an idea. And why I remark this is soon, because I think size itself is a challenge that condition all our actions. Uh, and we have many uh, hundred actors disseminated in the territory. We also have low population, we are a rural region, and most of the companies are in rural areas, and also we are an SMES territory. So we have, we developed a, a, in the latest year a strategy trying to tackle these uh, local and global challenges that we have, like the really the globalization with this uh, that is changing continuously the economy with new business models that are based in these new technologies. Uh, but also at the local level, we need to face the enormous extension of this territory, the, the population, and also the, the aging population, and now the COVID era. So, at plus, we need to get close to companies because um, there are micro companies far in rural areas, and we need to bring them these new opportunities. This has been the core of the strategy. Can you please move to the next? So, 
Uh, this approach uh, has more uh, sense now than ever with the, with the COVID era to get close and to disseminate these new technologies. The strategy tries to include very concrete actions uh, to speed up the development and take up of technologies. And uh, it's been executed by the basis of public and private cooperation with the engagement and the commitment of a network that we have called Entrepreneurship and Innovation Network uh, of a hundred actors of our innovation and science system, of course, universities, private sector clusters, and of course, companies which, uh, whose governance is not easy. We are um, working through working groups uh, in different thematics, always led by, by private sector or by uh, universities or clusters. And also, uh, finally, given the important and the financial issues has at all levels, we have developed a specific financial project called the Financial Shuttle, that is an innovative approach to establish a one-stop shop in business finance, and it combines a wide range of public and private financial instruments allocated for the different types of projects, R&D, entrepreneurs, and so, therefore, the regional government has signed a collaboration agreement with the main banks and has launched this instrument that enables uh, to the private and public financial sector uh, a better knowledge about the viable projects. Again, the size of the territory marks the way in which we have to deploy uh, our policies, uh, but again, in Castilla León, all is about cooperation. So, the second, can you move on, please? Uh, in this uh, context, oh, this is only a picture about the, the network and the next slide is a program that I want to remark is called Centra Tech that we have deployed with all the technological centers. Uh, it was launched in the context of ESPO, is our action plan, and is focused on how to reach the territory, again, rural areas and SMEs with innovation services, especially those related with digitization and industry 4.0. The program includes a complete itinerary uh, that covers the evangelism, the dissemination, uh, awareness raising, deepening about some specific technologies like uh, workshops, and also personalized diagnostics and technological implementation plans. In the context of the COVID era, I only want to remark that we also launched a telematic uh, personalized service to give support to companies in teleworking and cybersecurity. And we did this because we were in this uh, innovation and entrepreneurship network with some irrelevant actors like the National Cybersecurity Institute or the technological centers. And finally, going into the work cooperation, I want only to mention, I always say an African proverb that, of course, probably you will know that is that if you go alone, go fast, but if you go with someone, you go farther. So this has been really very important for us. We always stress the importance of cooperation and we seek the cooperation with all the actors through collaborative ecosystems. So we are now participating. Can you move further? Oh, I forget to show you the figures of Tendratec. Can you move to the next? These are the figures only to have an idea of the scope and, and the, the number of the services that we have provided. And now you can move to the, to the next, uh, that we are participating from the beginning of the Business Competitiveness Institute in many networks, which have, which have allowed us to position the region to give visibility to our actors, but also to look for allies and partners like the ESPO uh, projects. Um, only an idea I want to remark is that uh, these European projects must be perfectly aligned with your policies and measures to be really effective. If not, they will distract you from what you have to do, that is to, to give support to companies. Once you get the focus and once you get the, the right partners, this project like Expo will be really successful experience because they will allow you to internationalize your own ecosystem and stakeholders. And this is where the ideas that I want to 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 remark in this in this uh, speak that we are participating in so many European projects and thank you very much I hope we can continue cooperating cooperating with other partners in future thank you Beatrice thank you very much indeed for that I think that was very interesting because it looks at the territorial space and the the fact we talk about place-based innovation 
but uh, it's pretty clear then that each region is very different and on its territorial basis. And what I liked about that was the notion if you have a small population, you've got to get out, you've got to internationalize through networks and you've given some very good examples of that activity. I'm not sure now whether um, we can go back to one, um, if he's mm. available. Now? Is he now? available now? Yes? Yes, one, if you're can, perfectly. Can you hear me or not? Yeah, yes. we can. Ah, at last, sorry. Well, if, uh, well, thanks for waiting me. So that, uh, well, I'm not uh, seeing the, the presentation, but doesn't matter. Uh, uh -huh. Well, ah, yes, I can see. So, well, next, please. So, uh, well, this, uh, well, as everybody knows uh, at this moment, I call, well, due to the, the COVID-19, well, more or less, it says that uh, it could cost uh, about uh, the cutting of uh, 50 million jobs globally in the tourist industry. Then, so that, uh, well, next, please. Uh, in this in this sector it's uh, it's needed to to um to uh, to make a reorganization of the the, the tourist sector and analyze and pr try to promote to to the, the use of uh, new technologies in the in the SMEs companies of the the sector uh, understanding the, the the tourist sector uh, to all those companies that, uh, that could be hotels, campings, tourist guide, adventure tourists, tourist agencies, restaurants also. And the idea is how the new technologies can inspire them to, to, to create new business model, even in this, in this, uh, in this pandemic. Uh, so that uh, we want to present some uh, different uh, initiatives that uh, are already, let's say, in production. And some of them are, are starting to, to be promoted in other countries in order to, to try to, to, to encourage the tourists to, to go to, to different regions. So next, uh, next please. Well, this is an initiative that is uh, it's supported by, by the Basque Country government in Spain. And um, it started four years ago. And the idea, it was to, to try to, um, to make a, a digital to, to establish the digital maturity of all the sec of tourist se sector in, in Basque country in order to provide all these these small companies uh, of uh, different uh, digital tools in order to improve their their, their business in order to to um, to have a uh, more and more services based in in new technologies as a result of this this uh, of this um, initiative uh, we were talking with more than uh, 500 uh, SMEs in, in all the, the Basque country, and uh, at, uh, at the, at, uh, as a result of this, this um, of this uh, initiative, more more or less than 90% of the SME uh, were uh, certified with a quality um, level of, of uh, digitalization in, in, for for Basque country. This is an initiative that is already made in Basque country and it's still uh, working. It's uh, an idea that we are trying to, 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 to export to any other, to, to other, to other countries, mainly in Latin America, because they have uh, the same problems that uh, we have here uh, regarding the, the, the digitalization of, of, of uh, tourist companies. And uh, it, there is a need to, to open the, their, their systems or their services to, 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 to all, all the world. Next, please. The next, uh, well, they are divided in two of them, in two, in two different initiatives. Uh, one, one of them is related with uh, how the, 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 the data, how we can use the, 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 the data to create new, 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 uh, new opportunities. Uh, the first one is called Odeyan. It's a, a project that is uh, now uh, in also in, in, in Basque country government, and uh, it's intended to to try to. Um, um, how to say it? to manage the the the, the, tour, the the mobility of the tourist. So it's uh, it's able to to recognize uh, if a tourist is in one city, another city, and try to predict uh, what will be the the, the movement the movement of, of the tourist in a territory. This is very important because uh, knowing uh, having this this information, the the government can uh, can um, 
promote uh, different policies to uh, encourage the tourists to go to the concrete uh, region and in this case it's based in in private uh, data source it's uh, it's based in in the in the telecommunication uh, uh, in the telecommunication uh, companies data and also uh, data coming from uh, from credit card uh, use of use of uh, of tourists and in uh, in the same time we have another project very similar, but in this case, uh, we use uh, open source uh, data that is called West Tourist Observatory, in which uh, using the, 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 the monitoring the, the, the data coming from the ports, from the airports, from the, the border, because Basque countries in, in, in the border uh, between uh, France and, and, and Spain, just be able to, to create some dashboard that everybody can, can see and, and also the companies can see what is happening inside the, the territory. And uh, just to, for 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 finish, I want you to explain the last one that is called uh, that is called Second Goal, and it's another initiative to promote the tourism in a region by encourage uh, tourists to use a, an, a, a, smart, a smart bracelet in which the companies can uh, and the government also could introduce different ser tourist services, digital wallets, discounts, so that the tourists could uh, use this this, uh, this bracelet to uh, to move and to pay in, in different uh, in different uh, companies or or or, or uh, shops of a, of a specific territory. So with this kind of system, you can encourage the, the, the people, even the, the people from not only the, the tourists, also the, the people from 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 the territory to to uh, encourage to to spend more more money in the local uh, shops. So that that's uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Juan. Thank you very much, and thanks for getting the technology sorted. Lots of good ideas there on ICT on how you can really look at the, um, I, um, tourism. Uh, we're now going to just change slight change of the agenda. We're going to ask um, Daniela Chomkova from the Art Fund from Bulgaria, if Daniela is there, because just because she's got a bit of a time problem. So we bring Daniela just before Dita. So Daniela, are you there? And would you like to talk a little bit about the ICT vouchers and your innovation program? I, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, basically what, what follows next from, from Bulgaria is a policy and financial instrument uh, that uh, has been recognized as a good practice uh, by the ESPO partners within this project and also by the Interreg Europe program. And this is the business development program of Innovation Norway to support the innovation in SMEs in Bulgaria. The key advantage, uh, the key value of this program is its flexible management while following very strict um, procedures. So the shortcut in the interaction between the managing authority and the beneficiaries. And in the context of this, um, we would be happy to see what, what measures and challenges to respond to the COVID-19 crisis have been considered uh, or put in place by the program. And uh, we have the manager of Innovation Norway in uh, for Bulgaria uh, today with us. It is, she's uh, our honored guest today. So, Venti Anchovska, the floor is all yours, if you can hear me. Uh, yes. Can you see me? Yes. Maybe not no, yet. Here too. We can't see you, I think. Yeah. But we can hear you. Okay. Um, okay, maybe there is something wrong with the camera, but good afternoon to uh, all of you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present um, uh, some experience, both from Norway and Bulgaria. I will start first with, first with a few words about uh, Innovation Norway. And Innovation Norway is uh, the Norwegian state um, um, agency and this is the Norwegian government's most important instrument uh, for innovation and development of uh, Norwegian enterprises and uh, industries. Next slide uh, please. 
Um, as you know, Norway is not a member of uh, AU, and uh, together with uh, Iceland and Liechtenstein, uh, Norway is um, uh, through two financial mechanisms, the so-called EEA and the Norway grants, uh, the three countries uh, are contributing to reducing economic and social disparities and uh, strengthening bilateral relations with the 15 EU countries in uh, Central and uh, Southern Europe and, uh, of course, the Baltics. And uh, what is important is that the funding goes to sectors where a need has been identified and uh, in which Norway can contribute with uh, specific knowledge and uh, expertise. Uh, the total funding, next slide please, the total funding is close to 3 uh, billion euro. Uh, next slide. Um, Norway has been supporting projects in Bulgaria since 2007 and uh, for the current period uh, the name of the program is uh, Business Development, Innovation and SME uh, Bulgaria and its aim is to increase value creation and uh, sustainable growth in Bulgarian business sector. Uh, the program um, also seeks to uh, stimulate and develop long-term business uh, cooperation between Norway and Bulgaria, but based on business development and uh, innovation. And what is important is that 75% uh, of the funding should go to support uh, to small and medium-sized um, uh, enterprises. Um, Innovation Norway is the fund operator of the program and uh, it means that uh, it is in charge of the administration, assessing applications, monitoring of project, disbursement to project, uh, etc. Uh, for the um, last 10 years, more than 50 business projects uh, uh, were suppo uh, supported and uh, approximately 60% of uh, the approved project were implemented in a partnership between a Bulgarian and uh, Norwegian uh, companies or uh, entity. And there are two focus areas for the program which are very relevant for the current moment. Uh, the two focus areas are green industry innovation and uh, the so-called welfare technology. And the, the funding should go to support innovative technologies, uh, processes and services, sustainable business development, uh, greening of existing businesses and processes, uh, development and implementation of innovative products and services. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think none of us uh, was really expecting that the new decade will start with the so-called the Black Swan event. It means a situation that uh, deviates beyond what is normally expected and that would be extremely difficult to predict. Uh, and it has been a very challenging time for everyone. With this uh, world lockdown, our work and social life have completely changed. I will not comment on the negative implication of, from the COVID-19 outbreak, but um, I would like to share what has been done in Norway for supporting the businesses to overcome the crisis and what has been done in terms of the business program in Bulgaria. Uh, what is important that in Norway, the path from worry to decision has been very short. The Norwegian policymakers uh, have acted impressively fast and uh, the reactions and uh, actions um, both from businesses, different authorities, uh, social partners, etc., they were also very relevant and uh, fast. Uh, the package to support the Norwegian business <clears throat> proposed by the government and approved by the parliament is close to 100 million euro. And it's not only to cover measures uh, for um, uh, ensuring liquidity of the companies, but it's mainly uh, for activities for restructuring and innovation. And as you can see on the slide, um, four packages um, have been proposed and are supporting now. A package for green restructuring, a new loan scheme for green shipping, 
a subsidiary scheme for tourism industry and action plan for export export and um, uh, one important result is uh, there in april and in may innovation norway uh, gave more than twice as much in loans and grants as it was done the same month last year when it concerns the program uh, already because bulgaria um, the lockdown started uh, on 30th uh, 30th of march and immediately um, two weeks afterwards we organized a phone interview with all companies that are currently implementing projects we organized a short survey um, that was um, uh, including seven questions in three categories and um, uh, th there were the overall implication on the company operation implication on the project implementation and what the companies are expecting from innovation norway and the good thing is that um, uh, the good results is that um, the companies they reported that um, uh, in fact they were considering that um, uh, this uh, uh, crisis had some kind of positive effect on their development and they were taking the crisis as a test for their adaptability and uh, management uh, skills um, so there were no company that uh, was closed and um, uh, even they they managed to keep all the employees uh, to work for them and uh, in terms of what do they expect from the program they expect that the program continues to be uh, very flexible and that in case there is a need of project modification that the program uh, will act uh, accordingly and we also consider that in the future calls um, we have to take into consideration all the implication um, uh, coming out from this uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak and uh, at, the, at the end I would like just to say that um, when people think that there are no possibility anymore it should be turned the other way around no should be seen in a positive way new opportunities and definitely we consider that the current crisis creates um, preconditions for people and businesses to think in a more innovative and creative uh, ways yeah and uh, the cooperation among the EU countries yeah. should be really strengthened and more yeah. interregional projects should be supported. Thank you for your attention and yeah. I hope to see all of you yeah. offline. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Venceslava. Uh, thank you for that, for looking at the interesting, the way that the Norway grant works in, in Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, thanks for that information. Um, I'm, we're running a bit behind time, so I'd like to go quickly to our final speaker in this session, and that is Dieter Meyer, who is the founder of MCON in Lower Saxony, and he's going to talk a bit about uh, how we can look at technology needs in SMEs by dedicated customer support. So uh, over to you, Dieter. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, I'm happy to be with you, uh, and give an idea of a successful from our point of view, successful existing instrument. Nevertheless, we took the opportunity with UNESCO to improve it. So as I'm the last speaker in this uh, round, in this session, I will on the one hand try uh, to catch up and uh, keep the number of attendees uh, for this meeting. Uh, looking at the contents, what I'm going to say, next slide, please. I have uh, just uh, five simple bullet points uh, and uh, they, uh, they will all refer to what has uh, been said by Elspieta in the very beginning. So how to reach the SMEs, how to make instruments accessible for SMEs and how to organize a flexible support uh, for SMEs. So that's why my message is uh, and that's uh, topic in the next slide. 
uh, my message is even in very large regions, it is possible to reach SMEs in a very targeted and needs-based manner and uh, looking at COVID-19 uh, to adapt uh, uh, this instrument very quickly to changing framework conditions. Um, like Beatrice uh, from Castilla and Leon, uh, my region is a very large one, not that large uh, as a Castilla, next slide. Uh, it's the north of Germany, it's Lower Saxony, and just uh, very few figures. As you can see, large region, much bigger than Belgium, for example. Uh, it's a Nuts 2 region uh, and consists of uh, many uh, Nuts 3 districts uh, and uh, uh, even many more uh, companies uh, with a wide range. On the uh, one hand, we have this uh, size uh, as a challenge. Next slide. We have another challenge, uh, which you can see here. If you look at the uh, European Innovation Scoreboard, then you can see uh, we have green, which means in our case, very rural areas, uh, but um, uh, close to uh, metropolitan regions, Bremen and Hamburg uh, in the north. And on the other hand, you have very industrial regions in the south. And uh, so it's very uh, heterogeneous, uh, and uh, even the uh, the structure of the SMEs is uh, very uh, different. So the question was for us how to uh, how to reach uh, the, these uh, SMEs, how to improve innovation and keep flexibility. Next slide. Uh, so the instrument uh, is knowledge and technology transfer, and it. Uh, has to assist SMEs uh, to develop new products or services or improve them, to introduce new technologies, uh, to cooperate with science and to participate in innovation networks, things we have heard earlier from the poll. And uh, this uh, special solution in this case is that uh, the government of Lower Saxony as re responsible institution uh, authority for this uh, instrument, um, uh, they uh, offered two districts, a minimum of three districts, um, to apply for funding and uh, they had to prepare an own specific concept dedicated to the specific regional needs uh, to hire an own consultant or to employ an own consultant um, for knowledge and technology transfer, which is familiar with the regional situation, which has the confidence of, of the regional SMEs and things like that. And uh, thirdly, uh, they have to provide an own co-financing for the uh, for the uh, money uh, provided by the ERDF. So this is a, a very uh, strong uh, 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 yeah requirement from our point of view and it's uh, what we have heard if place-based policies are important this is just uh, very close to the SMEs very close to uh, what is needed. Next slide please. Um, if you have, have in mind the, the topics the objectives of this instrument then uh, it's obvious that uh, there's a lot of flexibility in it so uh, it was very easy to adapt it within the last few months uh, to the priorities um, uh, which are relevant now within COVID-19. So digitalization has been mentioned several times. Uh, so, uh, so we could switch uh, the uh, consultation uh, to these needs and even more important uh, to, to, um, to, to intensify the consultancy on processes and organization, which is uh, crucial. You may have heard in the media uh, about uh, the problems we have with uh, food production, with animal production here in the region, and so uh, we could immediately react on that. On the other hand, um, we uh, could even uh, uh, adapt the implementation support for the consultant 
adaptation. So on the one hand, we have switched uh, the scoring for funding uh, from innovation more to job creation. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, uh, we have modified the indicators for monitoring and evaluation the system. This is all uh, possible even within the existing um, uh, regulation and within the structures set. Uh, as such, um, of course, we uh, have uh, as a standard uh, element a kind of health check for the SMEs and uh, provide assistance in development of uh, new business models. Okay, last slide uh, referring to Interact, of course. So, uh, if we uh, look at the contribution of Interact and ESPO, we have the first two bullet points, of course, with the peer review uh, and the evaluation uh, by European partners, which was very fruitful for us uh, and gave a much stronger focus, not on the uh, uh, consultation itself, but even on the implementation of the outcomes of the consultation, uh, and uh, so to 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 bring it uh, down to earth. Within the region, it was somehow even more important because we uh, had uh, have a lot of uh, districts or consortia in the region uh, in in Lower Saxony and. Uh, uh, Interact and ESPO gave the impulse to cooperate uh, among the different consortia and exchange views and improve that. And uh, uh, secondly, we have uh, achieved a very strong commitment by the local politicians in the different districts. So the question of ownership of this uh, instrument was strong, and now the 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 the, the wish or the the preparedness to to react on COVID immediately uh, was very strong. And finally, against the Ministry of Lower Saxony, of course, uh, we uh, could. Uh, propose improvements and could uh, contribute significantly to uh, the continuation of the instrument from our point of view, even for the next funding period. So very practical, very uh, simple on the one hand, but uh, very uh, yeah, uh, uh, result-oriented. That's it. Last slide. Yeah, okay. Not to forget, uh, beyond technology transfer, uh, just a uh, look at, um, uh, at uh, cooperation on European level. By the way, uh, we were inspired by Tartu to set up a, 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 a known smart region visa backland strategy plan with different projects in the meantime and an even model project for Lower Saxony. So thanks to Interact, this was a, a, a side effect uh, of uh, our knowledge and technology transfer scheme. But that's really the, the end of it. Thanks a lot. And you're very welcome to ask questions or even to, to uh, have a bilateral contact and talk about uh, details. Thanks a lot. Dieter, thank you very much indeed. Uh, for that. Um, I thought it was very interesting. You mentioned this idea of between innovation and job creation or job retention that may be one of the issues coming up in post-COVID. But what I liked a lot was this idea of the collaborate, of speeding up the collaboration and dialogue, and also the fact of learning from other regions and bringing in new ideas. This is exactly what the Interreg project is trying to do. So uh, that's the final speaker from our final session. Uh, before we go into sort of concluding remarks and questions, um, I'd like to go to Ivana for the results of our last poll, please. So for this poll, we received um, responses from 49% of today's participants. It appears that the spread of new technologies like AI is viewed as the most important measure with 70% of votes, followed by adoption of more innovative public procurement methods with 68% of votes. And finally, the extension of the digital innovation hubs with 54%. So thank you everyone for participating in today's polls. I return the floor to you now, Richard and Tessa. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, Ivana, for that. Interesting, there's not much interest in harmonization of the fiscal side, which is quite on the uh, agenda at the moment. But now we'd like to go to Tessa Arne just for some final questions to our speakers in the last session. Um, somebody's asking to Mr. Garate, 
why the considering that the Basque territory is so highly industrialized, why are they so focused on tourism? Juan, so, if you're there. Remember that Juan had a problem with his microphone? Yeah. Ah, okay, it seems that he's not logged in anymore. So we will okay. ask him a question by email. Well, I think it may be the gastronomy is a big, we were talking about that earlier, that the um, the Basque country there is a lot of good food. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of people who go, do go to the Basque country for tourism. And it's also part of the Camino down to, San, in, to Santiago. So the northern route goes through the Basque country. So um, that may be that. And of course, Bilbao was one of the first sort of cities of this, or the, 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 the work that they did in there. So um, with the Guggenheim. So any other questions, Tessa? Uh, yes, one for Dieter Meyer um, about the COVID-19 support mechanisms. Uh, what is more effective for the long-term competitiveness for companies? What measures are taken um, by the regional authorities in Germany beyond the initial urgent measures adopted to support liquidity and job maintenance? So Dieter, are you ready to answer this? Uh, yes and no, <laughs> because um, uh, it's very easy for, for me to provide you with a survey of all the instruments in Germany. I can I can only tell you, it's it's uh, uh, even with 20 or 30 years of experience with public funding of innovation uh, uh, and uh, regional development, I'm I'm surprised, astonished. Uh, maybe even happy uh, about the, this variety of, of schemes. So uh, I, I'm not able just to, 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 to uh, explain it right now because there are so many for all different kinds. Uh, but I, I have a, uh, we have prepared a list with all these uh, instruments. And if you like, I, I, I send it to Urada and you can provide it then uh, with an overview of what, what is possible. So even with the long-term uh, uh, okay. effect. Thank you, Dieter. That seems really interesting for us. If we may share it, we will gladly do so. Um, I have one more for our coordinator, if I may, Richard. Um, how science parks can facilitate economic recovery of SME. So as Bieta, taking into consideration that Wielkopolska is one of the most RNI intensive regions in Poland, could knowledge providers play an important role in economic recovery, according to you? We uh, unfortunately well, cannot hear you. Yeah, I think now, now it's, it's the, the microphone is on. Actually, it's a very difficult question because Wielkopolska uh, as, the, as the economic fabrics, it's a lot of traditional uh, SMEs that are completely not connected with research activities that are uh, being done in really strong research sector in, in the region, which is mostly located in Poznań, several universities, several uh, institutes. So uh, on one hand, uh, on one hand, what, what we see as our role, but we are not really that much typical science of technology part because we do have a lot of services that go beyond the uh, what's within the territory of the science park is that we want to follow um, SMEs needs as they are and what we are doing is that we try to 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 be in the network with uh, actors intermediaries that are in several places uh, in the regions because they are very close to local companies and then if anything can be done by by the research offer and technology um, then we can help and because we are also very good in uh, in contacting those uh, researchers that have uh, ideas for new companies, solutions, technological solutions. And the other role that we can see is uh, there are now a wave of startups being uh, pr um, created by uh, ICT um, specialists. And, and we do hope that uh, the digitalization uh, will help uh, our companies, SMEs, to, to be uh, more competitive on European market. Thank you, Ashbeta. 
Richard, can we take one more? One last very quick one, because I think okay. we're losing some of our audience. So for Beatrice, um, we are wondering how you engage rural companies with Centra Tech in Castilla y Leon. How do you manage in the Regional Development Agency to provide 277 diagnostics? Did you select the companies from business directories or were there companies that you already knew? Yes, it's, it's difficult in, in, in such territory sometimes to, to select the, the companies, but we try to spread information through um, about uh, nine technological centers that covers all the territory. And also we work with some business association with clusters and in other cases with a regional uh, association of cooperatives or uh, the people that we have in the territory in some cases uh, to, to identify uh, the needs of the companies and which is the focus of uh, each seminar or event uh, in order um, to prepare a specific workshops. So it's really a challenge, it's really a challenge and we are now in the third edition of this program, Centra Tech, and the other day we were um, just designing how we could reach better or how we can improve uh, to, to get to, to companies, to, to reach the companies. But mainly through this business association, through other intermediaries, through the uh, entrepreneurship and innovation network with business associations and to identify the specific needs. Okay. I don't know Perfect. if I... Thank you very much, Beatrice, and thank you, Tessa, for the, the questions. I think we'll now come to our concluding part. Uh, and we've got just would like to just before we move to Elzbieta Shazek back on again to a concluding remark, I would just like to hand over to Christian Soublance, if he's still there, for one or two quick uh, reactions. Don't know if he's there. Yeah, we cannot hear. Christian, we see you, but we cannot hear you. And now? Now we can. Yes. Okay. So listening to all the presentation, I, I'm still hesitating. Shall we call new approach or adoption of existing approach to face the new situation? So I have uh, noticed that uh, a few mentioned that uh, the COVID has at least a good uh, point an acceleration of the dialogue between the stakeholders. I think it was mentioned three times. Uh, Tartu, Centre Val de Loire, pardon, and uh, the two studies uh, organized in Bulgaria. Have we seen real new solution? I think that was raised as critical conditions to try to find uh, a way to get out of the crisis. Uh, already uh, said quick reaction. Uh, there was also uh, this story about productive equipments, the adaptation with teleworking, which will probably last after the crisis. Uh, the other one are more adaptation or, 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 or a speed of uh, things doing, like access to finance through the one stop shop or the ICT maturity. Uh, mentioned by uh, our friends in P. Vasco. I also uh, noticed from uh, Dieter spread of new technology. That's what I mentioned by intelligence in my opening uh, presentation. I also uh, think that uh, this e-wallet from Basque Country to use uh, money to the local economy uh, should be seen by everybody on how to bring new business for local, very local, uh, small business. In Belgium, during the, the, the confinement, there was a lot of excitation for short circuit. And in the newspaper of Sunday, most of the farmers said, well, back to normal. Those who were there two weeks ago have already turned back to supermarkets and it's finished. So there is maybe some of the things that that, that we can uh, take uh, on 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 the uh, on it. 
Um, to come back to the question I had uh, about uh, re-industrialization, I think that uh, a role for all of us uh, working with Esprit and uh, entrepreneurial discovery process is to check the health of the supply chain. We have seen what happens for the pharmaceutics or the medical, but imagine that in the next weeks, there is a huge storm in China and maybe all your suppliers will be a bang, uh, bad position because they just continue to, to buy. So to have at regional level, a uh, B plan for supply chain would be probably the best uh, thing uh, that we could learn from from uh, the the crisis. The good news also of the day is that we have been reinsured that Interact will continue. So uh, yes, keep flexible, agile, and think about where to go in the next three to five years. Right. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much for those uh, comments and reactions. Very uh, good thinking about some of the issues that you've raised on that. Certainly, I agree with you, which has come out today very positive is the acceleration of discourse um, between and the dialogue between SMEs and organizations, intermediaries, um, uh, and various things like that. We'd now like to go to our final conclusion, it goes to um, Elsbieta Shazek from the project. Espo will give a final quick conclusion. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the idea was to, to, to provide some input from our activities of our partners and good practices that could help uh, to think of a, a policy towards SMEs in post-COVID era. And as we said, we don't know uh, what the world will come out uh, out of the crisis that we, we have now. The, there are some directions like relocation, diversification of supply and chain, and there are some notions that the uh, crisis is also opportunities for SMEs, but uh, those opportunity windows probably will be very short. So what we wanted to show is how to follow the SMEs needs and how we, and the, put the message that the uh, flexibility is also a way to uh, be uh, very short in answering the needs of SME because in the planning of ERDF support usually we take uh, many years perspective and if we want to to answer the very a quick opportunity that our SMEs have, we need to be really fast. I do hope that what we have shown related with with network, which hopes to which helps to to reach SMEs in uh, in different locations and make it as accessible for for a number of SMEs to really make an impact on on a way of uh, reactions to SMEs needs on on uh, collaboration will help everyone to uh, to prepare their own activities in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd just like to give a sort of final conclusion. Uh, so thank you from myself for the invitation to moderate today. Thanks very much to the URADA team behind the scenes for all the technical and various works and prepare, preparation and organization of today's webinar. I think it's shown that the ESPO project is a very successful project and has actually probably got a lot to say exactly what's happening now, but may also have some ways that we could influence the future of uh, the Interreg Europe project um, a policy and program, whether it could interplay into a different ways of looking at project development. But just to remind everyone that the slides and the recording of this um, webinar will be available on both the ESPO and the URADA website. And from then, I wish everybody a uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for those who are still with us. And of course, keep safe for the, the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I would like, to, uh, I would like to, to thank all the participants, but I would like I give special thanks to you, Richard, because you had a very difficult task to 
actually familiarize yourself with with what we have done uh, and try to to uh, control the uh, un uncontrollable uh, situations as we had with with uh, technical problems we for all of you it's good to know that of course we made a kind of rehearsal and everything of course went perfectly in the morning but in the afternoon always something can happen and i would like to to, to thank to you other team you've done a wonderful job in preparation and with with all the activities that had to required a lot of of collaboration with all of uh, of of the team and and the presenters and of course to uh the partners that were stressed to be very quick and short in the messages and of course we would like to share with all of you of more information so the messages will be sent to you uh after the the event thank you thank you very much Elsbieta. thank you Thank you. Next, uh, I think I hand over to Testo or Alberto for final technical goodbyes, but it's goodbye from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending and we'll sign off. Thank you. Bye.